Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. Doesn't it feel good to work together again, Tony? I'm Tony Kornheiser on ESPN2. Sure, whatever. Come on! You used to be a what? deuce sort of guy. I thought you gave the deuce its name. No, no, but I certainly... I certainly was there when it was created. Do you remember that? I know. When it was created? Yes, I yeah. do. I do. We're old. Wasn't that, wasn't that um, Oberman who was on a show Stuart in a Scott, leather jacket? Stuart Scott, Susie. Yes. Yeah. I think it, didn't, yeah, among others. Yeah, didn't Oberman open by saying, welcome to the end of my career? I always <laughs> laughed at that. Yeah, welcome to PTI, right. boys and girls. In today's episode, a great finish in golf, a bad start for Nebraska, and the end of the season. J.K. Dobbins. But we begin today with Javi Baez hitting a home run yesterday against the Nats and giving Mets fans the double thumbs down as he crossed home plate. Baez later explained, and I quote here, when we don't have success, we're going to get booed. So they're going to get booed when we have success, unquote. Mets president Sandy Alderson called Baez's gesture, again quoting, totally unacceptable. Wilbon, what do you call it? I call it heavenly. Let me start the show like this, okay? And let me dedicate that to Mets fans and all the people I'm sure who are on their side. I'm not on their side. I don't care about the Mets on a good day, and you know I don't care about their fans on the worst day. So it's all local. This gives me a chance to rant if I wanted to at I-95 and the bad behavior of fans. I don't think, I don't associate that with Boston. It's more New York and Philly and not even Washington. So just the middle third of I-95 fans, to hell with them. I'm glad Javi Baez did this. I love him. I understand fans get to boo. I understand that. But then you know what? You, you, you get as good as you give. And if Javi Baez wants to give them a visual boo. I am with him. I hope he's out of New York in his free agents uh, uh, offseason. I hope he comes back to Chicago. But wherever he goes, you know I love him anyway. And I love him particularly now for saying to loud, obnoxious fans, and that fan base can be characterized as that because I just did. Nobody is ever surprised when you knock anything in New York out of the jealousy you have and all Chicagoans have yeah, sure. for the Big Apple. I will move yeah. on from that. Javi Baez will not be with the Mets next year because Good. he's a free agent. Me, I would get rid of him today. When he came to the Mets from the Cubs at the trade deadline, the Mets were in first place. Since then, let me get the numbers right, they're 9-20. and 20. Baez is hitting 207 for the Mets, which stinks. I'm not saying there's a cause and effect, but I'm saying if it was me, I'd pay him out right now today. Good. I'd wish him all the best, get rid of him because he's a rental. It's a little bit harder with Francisco Lindor who also yeah. gave him the double yeah, thumbs down. That's right. Because Lindor has a 10-year, $341 million contract. And Lindor, by the way, hasn't been any good with the Mets. Batting 224, and he's missed 40 games. Kevin Pillar went thumbs down to the Mets, yeah. too. He's batting 212. Yeah. Mike, what I would say is those three guys are a big part of the reason that the Mets stink. Those three. And I agree with Sandy Alderson that you can't do this. You can't. And fans are allowed to boo. I also blame the Mets, Mike. For trying to buy a pennant in one year, which you just can't do. Can't Tony, do. Javi Baez wasn't hitting much more than 207 when he was with the Cubs. So what the hell did the brilliant Met geniuses in the front office think they were getting when they made these deals? To hell with them, too. This is, this is so cool that somebody has flown back in the face. You know what Javi Baez could have done? And I'm glad he didn't do that because he probably gets suspended. He could have given him another finger instead of a thumb pointed upward. So, you know, too bad. The Mets want to blame everybody. I'm glad you finally took some accountability at the end of your hot take yeah. that the, the Mets front office tried to do takes. something it couldn't you do. You must be confusing me. You, you must know, be confusing I'm, me with someone you, else. I don't no, do hot takes. Because New York That's guys are me. jealous of hot takes. Jealous of New York. I don't sure. do hot takes. I do hot I'm takes. just glad so do Javi Baez has done year. this. Of course you are. You love Javi Baez. I hope he does it again. And I hate the Mets yeah. and I hate the booing fans who want no accountability for their own actions. Let them take some accountability for their actions. Oh, no, you, you guys don't do that. You people. I get Let's rid of them tonight. Let's move to the FedEx Cup playoffs, which you and I are much more excited and positive about, where Patrick Cantlay pulled out an epic victory over Bryson DeChambeau, your boy. The two battled over 18 yep. regulation holes and six more in that sudden death playoff before Cantlay drained another putt. This one from 18 feet for birdie 
to win. DeChambeau seemed annoyed with Cantlay at times, and he also reportedly confronted a fan who yelled out, Brooksy! Tone, go ahead and get started. How you want to review this drama? So I thought it was one of the great sporting events I've ever seen. I loved it, and I watched it for hours, as did you. I have a certain partiality because I have played Caves Valley, and I know the course. So when I saw DeChambeau, who I know you hate, when I saw DeChambeau on number 11 flirt with the water, drive it over the water, land it on the throat of, of the fairway r right near the green, which is impossible. It can't be done. It was unbelievably beastly. But my largest takeaway was how rock solid Patrick Cantley was with the putter. Even though he stands over a putt for so long, you think he has paralysis. But he, and I want to make sure everybody understands this, there were five different putts that he had to make or he was going to lose. An eight-footer on 16 for par. An eight-footer on 17 for bogey after he went in the water. And you texted me and you said it's over right here. And it wasn't over. A 20-footer on 18 for birdie. Two more in the playoffs. And then he won it. They, the lead said 18 feet. I thought it was 22. 22. And I it was 22 I, feet. I, uh, the one that he won it with. Yeah. And the fans called him Patty Ice. And it was, it was as good a thing as I've ever seen. As good. It, was, it really it was. It was just great. It was something to revel in to the point where I, I found myself even rooting for DeChambeau to make that last putt, Tony, just because it would keep it going. It would send them into a seventh playoff hole. It was brilliant. He wasn't rock solid. He was brilliant. It's, that, that's the definition of nerves of steel. So much about golf is yes. overstated. You and I yes. play a lot. You a lot more than me the last year or so. But, you know, people talk about courage. It's not just the courage. Courage is when you step into the octagon or a boxing ring or even when you step in against somebody throwing 105 miles, 102 miles an hour. No, this is just nerves of steel. He has them. I mean, his nerves are incredible that he can stand over a putt and make them, drain them like this, and he's not going to be able to do it all the time. Your boy, by the way, DeChambeau, who is great for golf. You mentioned I hate I don't hate yep. him. I don't root for him. I root against him. So let's, let me make that clear. Yeah, I root against okay. him. Not my fave. Far from my fave. My favorite person in golf to root against. He is great for golf. You need DeChambeau as often as you can get him. But he choked like a dog because he missed putts of fewer than 10 feet. And if you and I were yeah. playing at Columbia on a Sunday and either one of us missed that many putts under 10 feet, one of us would say to the other, hey, you're choking. What's going on here? He's great. It's, he may win next week in Atlanta, but he choked. I love the way he hits driver without any caution whatsoever. I love the way he gets to the green from impossible lies in the spinach and stuff like that. Normally, he's a very good putter. The reason he won the U.S. Open at Wingfoot is because he was a very good putter. He was not a good putter yesterday. And there's two things he should have done, as far as I'm concerned. He should have made that last putt. And when it was over, he should have embraced Cantlay the way heavyweight fighters yes. do. Yes. When they he have had an epic again. bout. He, he should have done that. Great point. But I, Great point, I just, Tony. I got all texts, all the texts were exactly the same, and they said, are you watching this? And nobody yeah. had to say yeah. what this was. No, nobody was had great. to say. It was it Let's was go great. to your you Big mean, Ten, You mean Wilbon. you didn't have the quarterback duels all over the league ahead of DeChambeau and 10. Cantlay? They've already opened their football season. Illinois, a perennial doormat, beat Nebraska 30-22 to as Nebraska made terrible mistakes. Brett Bielma, who was so good at Wisconsin, is now at Illinois. And former Cornhusker National Championship quarterback Scott Frost is still at Nebraska, though maybe not for long. Nebraska is 12 and 21 under Frost. Does Frost deserve all the heat after only one loss? Yeah, because it's not just this one loss, Tony, that you're trying to, to decipher. And, you know, I, I, I talked a lot via text during this game. I watched every snap of that game. Uh, with our dear friend Mike Gleason, Nebraskan, who I feel bad for because there's so much anxiety, I mean, in the state of Nebraska. I mean, Scott Frost wasn't just supposed to deliver them back into contention. They thought he was going to be, you know, Tom Osborne part two. They, they thought that he was going to be the guy who led Nebraska back to greatness for years and years and years. Because let's face it, as a player, he was great, and he did lead them to that one year, I think an undefeated 13-0 and season. But, Tom. They're yeah. making the same mistakes. In, in Nebraska, in the media there, what you hear is this phrase, the same movie. Because Scott Frost used it in his postgame analysis, and it is. The same mistakes, bad mistakes, blunders, bad play calling, undisciplined play. And so they're in trouble. And they're not going to get out of it this year. They're not going to 
fire Scott Frost like after week five. That's not going to happen at Nebraska. So if people don't know about Nebraska because they're un under the age of 40, let's say, and they don't know about Tom Osborne and Bob Devaney, guys they named stadiums after, and they yeah. don't know that when Nebraska was in the Big Eight, they won multiple national championships. And Nebraska finds itself now in the situation that USC and Florida State find themselves in, that they used to be great, and now they're struggling to find their way. And if you take that job at Nebraska, that is a hot seat, kids, because they're not going to wait yes, around for you. Now, Scott Frost may get a little extra time because he was a player there at one point. But let's look at the last few coaches they've had. They fired Bill Callahan after 27 and 22. They fired Bo Pelini after 67 and 27. That was they dumb. fired Mike Riley after 19 and 19. You're 12 and 21 if you're Frost and 9 and 18 in the Big Ten. I thought he was a great hire, Mike. But the yeah. years other than the 13 and 0, other than the 13 and 0 at Central Florida, 6 and 7, 4 and 8, 5 and 7, 3 and 5, and now 0 and not 1. Cutting it. That's not 18 cutting and 28, Mike. You so know, this one game, maybe he's you not say, great. Did you say is a seat hot after one game? It's not this game. You got to take everything into account. I know you are, but people have to take yeah. everything into account when they evaluate Scott Frost, and that's what's happening. And his seat is hot now, right now. Mike Gleason going crazy as his alma know, mater poor gets bad. Let's take a break. Coming up, does UCLA's big win over Hawaii ease the pressure on your boy Chip Kelly? Speaking of... It's mail time where you dump your issues on us. Let me see what's first here. Mail time! Does one win over Hawaii ease the pressure on Chip Kelly? Not a bit. I mean, beating Hawaii 100 to 10 or whatever it was, I watched about a quarter of that, Tony. Beating them, that's the equivalent of an NFL preseason game. Because a real team is coming to town, coming to the Rose Bowl. LSU is coming out there this weekend, and a, uh, to me, you know, other than me with my local issues on my must game, Northwestern Michigan State, UCLA-LSU is the must-watch game, I think, of the weekend. And you want to see if Chip Kelly and his team have anything for a real team, not for Hawaii. And so, no, it doesn't ease any pressure or it doesn't make his seat any cooler. I don't think you disagree with that, do you? I will add one other game, Clemson, Georgia, as a must-watch oh, yeah. oh, situation along with, about that. along with UCLA and LSU. Um, I was amazed to find out that LSU is only a three-and-a-half-point favorite That's and that Chip Kelly has 20 starters returning. If he wins that game, they will carry him around the Rose Bowl in a chair and everything will be fine. But let's look at his record for a second. He was 46-7 and seven at Oregon. He's 11 and 21 at UCLA. That's Scott Frost territory. He went to the Eagles. He failed. He went to the 49ers. He failed. And he's failing right now, failing at UCLA. So beating Hawaii isn't going to mean anything if you go out and you lose to Stanford and you lose to Arizona State or something like that. I think we both wish him well. Yeah. But the LSU thing, that's big. Even a lot it's of conference, big, that's it's big. It's big, Tony. And by the way, even if they beat LSU, all is good for one week. By the way, letter. they announced 30-some thousand fans in the building. I watched, Again, I watched a quarter. It looked like there were about 15,000 fans. Of course, the Rose Bowl is enormous. That can happen. But they are on trial. There's, his seat is just as hot as Scott Frost's I agree. seat. Oh, I agree. I agree. Do you see the Niners sticking with a quarterback platoon? I mean, a pl platoon, I don't know, like that word. Do I see both those guys sharing the position um, and not out of desperation but out of a plan? Sure. Yes. Kyle Shanahan's a really smart guy, and he's not looking back at what he's done historically. He tends to look forward. And what, what, what can I do now to help this team and my situation and my guys? Good for him. I don't see them platooning by series or by play. Something Tom Landry, by the way, the great Tom Landry did against the Washington football team. No, it was against the Bears, actually, back in, like, 1970. It's been tried in the last 50 years, though, narrowly. I do see them sharing the position, Tony, a little bit more than it is usually done. I applaud that effort. Yeah, I don't. Um, that's just not the NFL way. You pick a quarterback and you stick with him until you have to yank him. Let's look at this for a second. Jimmy Garoppolo is a far, far better NFL quarterback than Trey Lance. Jimmy Garoppolo took this team to a Super Bowl. Jimmy Garoppolo, as a starter, is 22-8 and eight in San Francisco. And Trey Lance played one game last year in college. One game. Jimmy Garoppolo's problem is he gets hurt. If he doesn't get problem. hurt, we, it, and, and it is, and that's why you have to backstop everything by getting Trey Lance. 
But yes. Trey Lance isn't ready to be an NFL quarterback sharing time right now with Jimmy Garoppolo. Sure they average 28 points a game when Jimmy Garoppolo is the starter. So if he's healthy, he's going to be the quarterback. Look at what Sean Payton is doing and has done in New Orleans. You can put Trey Lance in there for X number of plays to help that yes, team. Yes, like the Taysom Hill. You can't, yes. they're, not, they're not looking back to a 16-game schedule, the NFL, are they? No. They keep looking forward to Mo, 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 Mo. And the Kyle you can do that. Guy. You can, you can have a second quarterback who you use, but you can't yeah. platoon. I We've said had a help problem with the word platoon. Let's take one last break, but still to come, a new team for Gardner Minshew. God. And a big loss for the Ravens. Kathleen Kevin Black is stolen. Booing your own fans for booing you. <laughs> the New York Mets. Mets sing like only the Mets can. We've got a Mets centipede today. And also whether Cam ever gets his high five for Mac. <laughs> Yes! Oh. There we go! All is good in New England. Like when I strike out and I get booed, you know, it doesn't really get to me, but like I want, I want to let them know that what we should say is we're going to do the same thing to, to know how, to, to let them know how, how it feels. In my case, they, they got to be better, you know, I, love, I play for the fans and I love the fans, but, you know, if, if they're going to do that, they, they're just putting more pressure on the team, and, and that's, not, that's not what we want. The Mets, via the statement from Sandy Alderson here, are taking the side of the fans, not the side of Baez, Lindor, Pilar, Stroman posting his view that media is always trying to stir controversy, and we won today, that's all that matters. And then he was retweeting posts that say fans are soft and entitled and his example was wrong with society. Owner Steve Cohen posting that he wants to focus on the win too. Today they had a team meeting. Clint Yates, around the horn to you. How bad is this for the New York Mets? And can any part of you see the players thumb down side of this? I can see the player's thumbs down side of it. That doesn't mean I have to hear it or that I mean I have to buy it. But also, the reason why this is such a Mets thing is because not only are they playing themselves, but they're doing it in particularly lame fashion on top of that. They've been doing this bit for three weeks, but nobody knows because they were crash landed out of the Dagon playoff race in the NL and they couldn't have enough good things to anti-celebrate. Why don't you worry about your road record in terms of what the Mets are doing, your 15 games under 500, than worrying about what the fans who are paying to say, it's just so much stuff that the Mets constantly do. It's embarrassing, yo. What are we doing? Tim Kalisha? You know, nobody knew about it because they were never on base. You got to do that first to be able to make the signal. Now, there are certain things you can do, and, and we've seen it through time. You can get in fight with teammates. You can certainly get in fights with the media. You're probably going to win that battle with a lot of the fans. You can get in fight with your manager. If you're Billy Martin, you can have the greatest quote of all time about Reggie Jackson and and George Steinbrenner and saying one's a born liar, the other's convicted. You can get away with that. <laughs> but taking on the fans and basically saying boo to the fans, there is no possible. What are you going to win? How are you going to win that fight? The Mets have been a hugely underachieving team, uh, starting with Francisco Lindor, who, who took a giant contract to go to New York. He knew he wasn't going to Cleveland. Things might be different there if his OPS is below 700. And, and this is how the players respond. It's just preposterous. Emily Kaplan. You know, I ultimately feel for Baez because I agree with his point. Fans sometimes forget that these players are human and they act cruelly. That said, as a professional athlete, you've got to hold yourself to a higher standard. And Baez acted immaturely. Also, dude, read the room. You're on the Mets now. The fans do not care about your opinion when you've been on the team for under a month. It's funny, when you actually watch the line of questioning, you can see the reporter start to giggle like he can't believe Baez is saying this. Like, oh my goodness, is going to get blown out of proportion. And it was. If you read the Daily News today, it's Baez to fans. Go to hell. Not what he actually said, which is fans need to be better. But that's what happens in Flushing. It's different than Chicago. It's different yeah. than the Bronx. And I'll just end you with this. Derek Jeter once was asked about the fans booing him. And he says, if I was a fan, I'd boo me too. That's how you win on and off the field. Also, by just winning. The go to hell, of course, is a famous uh, New York tabloid headline that they're invoking there. Kevin Blackeslin, I'll bring you in here. 
Well, I think Lindor and Baez in particular have lost their license to criticize the fans, given that one is batting a sees a, a career worst 224, and the other one, Baez, was coming in batting about 211. So you you have no license to criticize the uh, uh, criticize the fans there, and you want to talk about how hard it is to play baseball, and that you're just machines, and that um, you know you need them to help you. So are you blaming them for your poor performance? That doesn't seem fair. I will admit, though, that fans. Um, um, you know, they, they...